Chapter Nine of Our Little Canadian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean McGahey. Our Little Canadian Cousin by Elizabeth Roberts MacDonald. Chapter Nine. To invalids or to the really destitute, Canadian winters, clear and bright though they are, may seem unduly long, but for our little Canadian cousins, warmly clad, warmly housed, and reveling in the season's healthful sports, the months went by as if on wings. With March, though the winds were strong, the sun began to show his power, and by the middle of the month the sap was running, and the maple syrup making had begun. Jackie persuaded his father to take him out one morning to the woods and to help him tap a number of trees. When they went back later and collected the tin cups which they had left under the holes in the trees, they found altogether about a pint of sap. This they took carefully home, and Jack persuaded everyone to taste it, then boiled the remainder until it thickened a little a very little, it is true, and the family manfully ate it with their muffins for tea, though Mrs. Merrithew declared that she believed they had tapped any tree they came across instead of keeping to sugar maples. Toward the end of the month, Mrs. Gray got up a driving party to one of the sugar camps, and though it was chiefly for grown people, Mrs. Merrithew allowed Dora and Marjorie to go. The drive was long and rather tiring, as the roads were beginning to get slumpy, and here and there would come a place where the runners scraped bare ground. But when they reached the camp, they were given a hearty welcome, allowed to picnic in the camp house, and treated to unlimited maple syrup, sugar, and candy. The process of sugar making has lost much of its picturesqueness since the more convenient modern methods have come into use. Mrs. Gray remembered vividly when there were no camp houses with their big furnaces and evaporating pans and no little metal spiles to conduct the sap from the trees to the tins beneath. In those days the spiles, about a foot in length, were made of cedar, leading to wooden troughs, which she maintained give the juice an added and delicious flavor. But this their host of the sugar camp would not admit though he agreed with her that the process of boiling must have been much more interesting to watch when it was done in big cauldrons hung over bonfires in the snowy woods. When the visitors left camp, each one carried a little bark dish called a cosso of maple candy presented by the owner of the camp, and most of them had bought quantities of the delicious fresh sugar. April brought soft breezes, warmer sunshine, and melting snow. It seemed to Dora that people thought of scarcely anything but the condition of the ice and the quantity of snow in the woods. Then they began to say that there would be a freshet, and Debbie, who was apt to forebode the worst, announced that the bridges would go this time, sure. Mr. Merrithew only laughed when Marjorie asked him about it and said that this prophecy had been made every year since the bridges were built, and that there was no more danger this year than any other. But Mrs. Merrithew, though she could not be said to worry, still quietly decided what things she would carry with her in case of a flight to the hills. The freshet, which was talked about so much, was, in spite of Mr. Merrithew's laughter, a remote possibility, certainly not a probability, in his own and Mrs. Merrithew's youth, it had been so imminent that people actually had gone to the hills. A tremendous jam had been formed a few miles above town, but a few days of hot sun had opened the river farther down and the danger had passed. Since the two bridges, however, had been built, some people thought that there was a chance of the ice jamming above the upper bridge. Usually, the worst jams were between the islands, not far above town. Each day some fresh word was brought in as to the river's condition. The river St. John is like a sick person, isn't it? Dora said one afternoon. The first thing everyone says in the morning is, 
I wonder how the river is today. The words were scarcely out of her mouth when Mr. Merrithew came in hastily, calling out, Come, people, if you want to see the ice go out, the jam by Vine Island is broken. Come quick, it's piling up finely. In a very few minutes, the whole family answered to his summons, and they set out in great excitement to watch their dear river shake off its fetters. They made their way quickly to the wooden bridge and found a good share of the population of Fredericton there assembled. It was truly a sight well worth going to see. Below the bridge, the dark water was running swiftly, bearing blocks of ice, bits of board, and logs. Indeed, a fine medley of things. But above the bridge... Jackie clapped his hands with delight as he watched the ice, pushed by the masses behind it, throw itself against the mighty stone piers and break and fall back while the bridge quivered afresh at each onslaught. It was truly grand to see, and they stayed watching it for more than an hour, stayed till Jackie began to shiver and Mrs. Merrithew hurried them home. By the next morning the river was rapidly clearing, so that some reckless spirits ventured to cross in boats and canoes, dodging the ice cakes with skill worthy to be employed in a better cause. In a day or two, more of the deep whistle of the river boat was heard, a sound that brings summer near, though not a leaf beyond the trees. But it was not until the ice had entirely ceased running and the river had begun to go down that really warm weather could begin, for until then there was always a chill air from the water. But after that, ah, then spring came in in earnest, with balmy airs and singing birds, pussy willows silver gray beside the brooks, and little waterfalls laughing down the hills. Then came the greening fields, the trees throwing deeper shadows, and the mayflowers pink and pearly and perfect, hiding under their own leaves in damp woodland hollows. The children made many excursions to gather these fragrant blooms and kept quantities of them in the den until the season was over. It would be hard, Mrs. Merrithew thought, to find anything more lovely and to show how thoroughly she appreciated their attention. She made for each child a little Mayflower picture in watercolors. In Marjorie's, the flowers were in a large blue bowl on a table covered with an old blue cloth. For Jackie, she painted them in a dainty shallow basket, just as he had brought them from the woods. And for Dora, there was a shadowy green bit of the woodland itself, and a few of the braver blossoms just showing among leaves and moss. End of chapter 9 Recording by Sean McGahey, Midland, Ontario, ducttapeguy.net.